Thank you for joining us for Talking Sleep, a podcast of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Seema Kosla, Medical Director of the North Dakota Center for Sleep in Fargo. As Philips Respironics continues to exit the U.S. sleep market, we are looking at replacements for our current diagnostic devices. This includes in-lab hardware and software, home sleep apnea testing, in addition to other treatment options, such as the Night Balance Lunoa, which really hasn't been available for some time now. The Philips ActiWatch is a popular actigraphy device that is no longer sold and will only be supported for the short term. This comes right as the AASM has been advocating for reimbursement for actigraphy. Dr. Paul Raymond is here to discuss the seemingly opposite directions of these two developments. He serves as medical director for the northernmost sleep lab in the world, in addition to providing sleep services at home in Alaska. He has been instrumental in providing sleep education to his colleagues in Alaska via the Alaska Sleep Medicine Conference. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So it seems like we're talking a lot about actigraphy, you know, more than I remember before. So do you think this kind of started with the 28, uh, 2018 guidelines? No, actually, actigraphy goes back to the 70s uh, and was used mostly as a research tool back then. And actually, the first guidelines came out in 1995, where it was uh, the guidelines were to be used for research and not clinical use. And then subsequently, over the years, it's been evolving. In 2002, um, they found the new guidelines that it was reliable for normal sleep to establish total sleep times. And then in 2007, the subsequent guidelines said that maybe it was useful in some clinical situations. And then that brought us to the most current guidelines, uh, which were written in 2018, uh, which further defines where it's used. I'm kind of surprised that the first ones for clinical use were 2007. I thought it was older than that. Not actually as part of the guidelines. I think there huh. were people that were using it as an accessory tool. Interesting. So remind me what those guidelines stated about actigraphy. I, I, from what I remember, it was sort of what is appropriate usage of actigraphy? Yeah, and specifically in 2007, uh, actigraphy was correlated with the polysomnogram for differentiation of sleep from wake as well as total sleep time and had a, a strong correlation of you know around 90 to 96 percent. And so that was the main thing that was um, mm. as part of that guideline. Uh, today, that in 2018, it's still part of uh, one of the guidelines, but it, it certainly isn't the, the main focus that we use actigraphy on. Mm. And so that was correlation for nocturnal sleep, right? But not for naps? That's correct. And mostly used uh, in conjunction with home sleep apnea testing, where a home sleep apnea test has is based on total recorded time, not total sleep time. So by combining the actigraphy, you could get the total sleep time uh, if uh, if you correlated the two together. Which, you know, the reimbursement when you add total sleep time is higher. So, you know, that's a plus. Um, I'm really kind of excited, though, about the AASM and their advocacy efforts to get reimbursed for actigraphy itself. So tell me more about this. Well... First of all, if we can go back to the guidelines for a second, um, in 2018, there was a consensus statement from ASM uh, through a task force that defined where actigraphy should be used. Okay. And uh, there were eight uh, recommendations at that point. Uh, the first recommendation was to use for the assessment of total sleep time and uh, and in assistance in diagnosis with adults with insomnia. And that was uh, backed by 46 uh, random controlled trial studies and had moderate um, uh, uh, strength to that recommendation. Um, following that, the second recommendation was the use of actigraphy in the evaluation of the pediatric population with insomnia. Mm -hmm. The third was the use of evaluating circadian rhythm sleep wake disorders in adults. The fourth is also in sleep wake disorders, but in pediatric population. The fifth goes back to the 
uh, conjunction with home sleep apnea testing to uh, help define uh, the total sleep time. The reality is that was a weak recommendation, and we don't really utilize it because it really didn't make much clinical difference. Mm. Uh, so the only time we use it is if the actigraphy is actually embedded in the actual home sleep apnea device itself. Right, right. And then the sixth recommendation was using it for the evaluation of central disorders of hypersomnolence with the MSLT in both adult and pediatric patients. And and this improved both the diagnostic accuracy of the MSLT and reduced the unnecessary or inappropriate treatments of, um, of misdiagnosed hypersomnias. Mm. Uh, the seventh was to be used for evaluate patients with insufficient sleep syndrome. And then the last was a uh, recommendation not to use actigraphy in place of electromyography for a diagnosis of periodic limb movement disease as it resulted in inappropriate diagnosis and inappropriate treatment. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I understand you use a lot of actigraphy in your practice. I do, um, or we do, I should say. Um, we use it for all the above, for um, circadian sleep disorders, for uh, insomnia, for insufficient sleep syndrome, and obviously for the MSLT. So do you get reimbursed for it? We get reimbursed sometimes. So, you know, <laughs> using the CP, uh, using the CPT code 95803, uh, in Alaska, we get reimbursed by Maritain uh, EBMS, which is a self-insured uh, policy of the most of the teachers in the state that's run by Aetna, and then Blue Cross Federal Employees and that reimburses about four hundred and fifty dollars on if we use the diagnosis code of um, F forty seven or G, I'm sorry G forty seven point one zero, which is uh, hypersomnia unspecified. The VA also uh, reimburses at three hundred and sixty dollars, and they will also reimburse for primary insomnia or F fifty one point oh one. And Alaska Medicaid will reimburse on the hypersomnia code at two hundred and five dollars and sixty three cents. Wow, that's that's definitely more than I thought. I you know I've always kind of wondered why this hasn't been reimbursed, right? Because there's you know you purchase the device and there's you know technologist time in terms of downloading it and then you know professional sort of interpretation of this, and it really is an important part when we are you know, making a diagnosis of, you know, a number of sleep disorders. And in the long run, I think it saves money uh, as well as provides better care. For instance, uh, especially with MSLTs, uh, if we're inappropriately doing MSLTs on patients with, that really have insufficient sleep syndrome, then we've wasted both financial as well as professional and patient time. Yeah, I mean, that's totally true. I, you know, we have a couple of active watches. I have a very small um, private practice. And I was very sad because one of our watches broke. <laughs> so now I'm trying to figure out what to replace it with. Well, that's a problem that we all face. And, mm -hmm. and we use active watches. And, you know, we certainly have tried to do research. There's a um, good review from 2018 in Sleep Magazine. I believe it would be November, December. Um, that looked at all the different active watches and compared them. So we, are, we like a lot of people, are scrambling to figure out which possible ones we're going to replace it with. And, you know, we've looked at uh, the Motion Watch 8, uh, the Somno Watch Plus, and the Act Trust. Uh, the, and they all have pros and cons. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, as actigraphy evolves, I mean, actigraphy by definition is really a, a movement sampled several times per second by accelerometers in the devices. But mm. the truth is most uh, actigraphy units these days do other things. And most of them have light sensors. Some of them have temperature sensors. Um, one of them could actually get core temperature by swallowing a, a pill that transmits the core temperature during the night. Uh, so there's all sorts of different uh, the validated accessories to these actigraphs. Okay, I've never heard of that one. Where you swallow a pill for core temperature? It's wow. It's actually uh, the, mo the Motion Watch 8. 
uh, specifically. Uh, you can has an ingestible tablet that transmits to the device. Uh, so, you know, you can see down the line that that this is going to evolve further. So, you know, if you know exactly when the the core temperature nadir is, we can mm -hmm. more be much more specific about our instructions on phototherapy and, and melatonin therapy and, and especially in the circadian uh, sleep-wake disorders. Okay, that's fascinating. And I'm assuming those are single use, right? Yeah, I don't think they recycle those. <laughs> so do you get, have you tried that one yet? Do you get pushback from patients? We haven't tried any of these. We're, we're in the process of researching like most people are. We yeah. still have the Acta watches. That's fast. You know what I love about the Acta watches? I really love the um, light exposure piece. Absolutely. And we use it a lot. I mean, you can tell when somebody's on their cell phone right. for the most part uh, because the spectrum of light that it shows. Yeah, and it was kind of interesting. There was a study, I forget when, but they sort of coined the term tepigraphy, and that was felt to be a better marker for sleep onset, sleep offset. And it had to do with how many times you touched your phone because, you know, being on your phone is sort of the first thing you do in the morning, the last thing you do at night. And so that was how they distinguished sleep onset and sleep offset was just their use of the, of the cell phone. So I thought that was kind of cool to turn that into sort of the tepigraphy science. Uh, I agree. You use actigraphy pretty frequently then, and it sounds like you use it for all of the things you delineated. So insomnia and obviously before MSLT and I'm sure circadian rhythm, sleep-wake disorders, right? Um, do you make adjustments to it depending on the patient? Well, the algorithms, at least on the ActaWatch, and I can't say this for others, but the algorithm, the ActaWatch, uh, the the automated scoring pretty much designates the sleep onset and sleep offset time. But you can tell uh, if you look at the data uh, where there is a lack of activity during the day, if they're napping, or you can tell um, if there's uh, increased activity during the night, et cetera, that you can fine tune that or, or kind of overscore that. Uh, to get further information uh, from the from the raw data. So is that something you physically do, or do you have someone in your office who takes care of it for you? No, uh, myself and what, one of the other clinicians usually read all the actographs, and, huh. and we usually do that ourselves. I remember speaking with Kathy Goldstein a few years ago about this, and she kind of talked about the difference between research-grade actigraphy and clinical actigraphy, and how most clinicians just sort of use it as it sits out of the box, right? But in the research realm, they, you know, tweak, and then it makes it more, um, I think, reliable. And so when she talked about sort of usage of actigraphy, she's very clear about well, this is research-grade actigraphy, they have made the adjustments versus clinical actigraphy where people generally don't make the adjustment. And so I imagine you probably have um, maybe better data because of, of the adjustments that you're making. I don't think so. I would compare this to people that have home sleep apnea test units that rely on the algorithm of the home sleep apnea test to uh, provide the AHI or the REI, um, mm -hmm. but without scoring, right? So, yeah. you know, we certainly overscore our home sleep apnea tests. Uh, and I, I would look at actigraphy the same way. I think you have a better study if you go into the raw data and actually rescore it. That's a really good way of looking at it, that you're kind of comparing it to looking at the um, HSAT raw data. So very cool. So then what kind of adjustments do you typically make? Uh, usually you're looking for uh, activity during the night um, and how many awakenings they have, as well as lack of activity during the day. If they're napping uh, mm. during the day is probably the main things I look at, uh, obviously. So you're changing sort of the auto score then? Like you're changing sleep and wake? To some degree, yes. Okay. I don't necessarily change it in the report. I usually just comment on it. Ah, on the, okay. On the 
on the aspects of that. Okay, that makes sense. How do you use actigraphy for insomnia? Well, the same way is, you know, uh, if you ask an insomniac uh, to take a, do a sleep log or ask them how much sleep they get, an insomnia, insomniac always underestimates the total mm-hmm. sleep time that they have. So they may not be getting adequate sleep, but they'll tell you that I'm only getting four hours a night. But if you actually do that actigraphy, you find they're getting five and a half hours mm-hmm. a night or six hours a night. So it may still be insufficient sleep. But it's different than their perception of sleep because their their per, their perception is they that they don't sleep at all. Right. Correct? So kind of for that paradoxical insomnia, then. Exactly. I mean, I think that's you know, and I use it as an educational tool for the patient mm. to say, "This is where we're at. This is where our goal is," and you use that to help uh, substantiate that that their and and to. Um, you, to enforce the use of cognitive behavioral therapy mm. to help change their perception of, of sleep. I think that can always be a tricky conversation too, right? Because you have to present it in a way where you are unified, right? I, I, I hear what you're saying. This is what actigraphy says. And we think that maybe, you know, there's a little, you know, paradoxical insomnia or, you know, a misperception of when you're awake and asleep. Um, and I and I feel like that's very delicate because you certainly don't want it to be antagonistic, right? Saying, well, the actigraphy says you sleep seven hours, <laughs> right? It's more of a, hey, let's take a look and let's assess why you feel that way, right? Is it sleep quality? Is it, you know, do you wake up at night? Like, what are the components of why you feel like you don't sleep well? Well, I think that's the art of being a clinician. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, first of all, the patient actually uh, came to you requesting help with this problem. Right. So, so you are their advocate. Uh, so, as long as you approach it that way, I don't, I don't see that it's antagonistic. There, there's, there, there's, you're not being antagonistic. You're actually using that data to help facilitate change. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? I just, I feel like it's something that we need to be mindful of in how we present that data. Right, because we are like you're right. We are there to advocate for our patient, and let's look at this data together, and you know, let's talk about you know why you feel your sleep is poor and what can we do to improve it. So then, I imagine you probably use this as part of CBTI, then sort of to demonstrate change before and after. Absolutely, mm. it's good for help diagnostic purposes, but it's also good for monitoring purposes. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I kind of, we kind of laugh about it in the office because it always seems like whenever somebody has, um, you know, is utilizing actigraphy, something unusual happens, right? It's either, you know, daylight saving time or they had a trip or they had something, they had an exam. Um, so we always kind of chuckle that it's never a normal week. Is that, is that just unique to our practice or do you see something like that too? Oh, I think that's part of, um, and, you know, that's the advantage of having longer periods. So we always do two-week actigraphies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you lose one or two days during that two weeks of actigraphy, you still have plenty of data to work with. So I, I think that's the, the problem with, you know, actigraphy, the, the CPT code is uh, defined as at least 72 hours up to 14 days. Mm-hmm. Well, the problem with doing a 72-hour study is just what you said is you have very limited data even if everything goes perfect. Uh, and and in most cases, it doesn't go perfect. Right. <laughs> yeah, we always try. We always shoot for, we always shoot for two weeks. You know, sometimes the battery dies before then. But yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's art to it too, isn't there? So let's take a short break. And when we come back, we'll talk more about actigraphy. You're listening to Talking Sleep from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Are you a medical fellow or resident looking for the right specialty for your career? Sleep medicine is quickly gaining recognition as a fundamental discipline of health and wellness. This specialty offers medical fellows a unique opportunity to delve in an ever-evolving field. Interested in expanding your knowledge base through industry-leading research and professional growth opportunities? 
join over 9,000 AASM members dedicated to helping patients achieve optimal health through better sleep. Learn more about membership benefits at aasm.org. Welcome back to Talking Sleep. We're talking with Dr. Paul Raymond about actigraphy and the AASM's advocacy efforts for reimbursement. So tell me about some of the AASM's advocacy efforts to get reimbursement for actigraphy. Well, first of all, this started in October of last year when we made it our goal to um, uh, for this year uh, to try to get actigraphy reimbursed by not only private payers, but by government payers. Mm. Uh, and so uh, we basically highlighted the importance of actigraphy testing for certain sleep disorders and to urge payers to reimburse healthcare providers uh, for this obviously evidence-based service. Mm. Currently, that failure of insurance companies to not reimburse for that service results in a significant access to care barrier for patients that would otherwise be benefited. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you commented earlier that, you know, we have this kind of, um, we have this advocacy for actigraphy reimbursement. At the same time, we have uh, actigraphy units that are no longer going to be made. And the other thing is, if you look since 2013, the billing of actigraphy has decreased by 86%. Because Has people it just really? Gave up. Oh my goodness! I bet I, we gave up. That's true. We I can't remember right. last time we even tried to get reimbursed for it. So basically, um, we decided to focus on the evidence that supports the use of actigraphy in both adult and pediatric patients with sleep disorders, and um, we set out describing um, and demonstrating in clinical practice offering recommendations regarding the coding and documentation, and then providing the opportunity for members to take action by encouraging payer policy alignment with ASM evidence-based guidelines. Mm -hmm. So in October, the ASM staff, specifically Deidre Gray, reached out to Medicare administrative contractors to discuss actigraphy language in the local coverage determinations or LCDs. And out of that, we actually got a response from one, the Palmetto GBA, and the the GBA from Palmetto uh, that covers Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia, uh, was actually very positive. We had a meeting uh, with the medical director. He made it clear that that the reason activity wasn't uh, being covered was because the Medicare administrative contractors were not aware of the evidence to support it as a standalone service. And he suggested that ASM submit a request for reconsideration to the MACs, Mm. providing the evidence in the literature to support, including individual studies, literature reviews, and then suggesting language and corresponding diagnostic codes. Deidre Gray's great, isn't she? She is wonderful. You know, what's funny is I, I, so I, I practice in, you know, Fargo, North Dakota, and, you know, we have a sort of encatchment area and I've sort of been removed from the Palmetto GBA or so I thought, because I actually had a patient in South Dakota that had that insurance policy. So it may not be as limited as we thought. Yeah, actually I, I'm in Alaska and it seems like we have a lot of, uh, Blue Cross of Alabama and other mm-hmm. insurances these days. It's so really funny. The, so the next part was the staff sent out emails to uh, groups of private payers encouraging policy modifications. And then we've developed um, a social media posts um, to encourage members to submit a template letter that you can find on the ASM website, mm. informing uh, them of the importance of actigraphy. Those posts got placed on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We also obviously are doing this show. Dr. Uh, Sahila uh, Hadigal um, did a video, which was posted on the a- ASM uh, payer advocacy page, as well as on social media, also uh, instructing uh, ASM members how to download the template letter and uh, send it on to payers. Mm. And then lastly, uh, We uh, have worked on the request for reconsideration document uh, and all the supporting documentation that was required 
And that actually is being submitted to the board of directors of the ASM for approval today. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So we'll have to include a link in the show notes if anybody wants to download that template. So Absolutely. What do you think about wearables? And will these will we start utilizing these in place of actigraphy in the future? Well, the problem with wearables is um, they they definitely are useful for us as clinicians, I think, but none of them have truly been validated. Uh, and the the most of the algorithms are proprietary. Mm -hmm. So the raw data cannot actually be viewed. And without that ability, um, I I think until the wearables come to that point where they either open up the algorithms to so that the, they can be validated, I think they're just that. I think they're a useful consumer item, but not necessarily uh, uh, going to be useful from us as clinicians. Mm. Uh, Obviously, I think that actigraphy and consumables are going to evolve with time. And I think that there will be studies that will use some of these con um, consumer wearables down the line that may make them validated. But at this point, uh, I think that's where it stands is that they really are more for uh, consumers and not for clinicians. Yeah, I remember that one paper, it's been maybe a year or two ago now, that demonstrated that there were some wearables that were maybe even superior to actigraphy in differentiating sleep versus wake for that nocturnal sleep period. Um, but like you pointed out, it's all black box algorithm and we can't look at the raw data. And then certainly you wouldn't be able to make those adjustments like you described earlier. Um, where I was kind of going with it is thinking about is this a way for us to, you know, have longitudinal data on our patients, right? And we're already collecting this information, but at some point, would it maybe satisfy our TM or our PM billing? And I'm thinking our TM in terms of like um, insomnia and CBTI, you know, or even like circadian sleep-wake disorders or something like that. I don't, I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts? Do you think at some point it may satisfy that? I don't know. I mean, maybe. I mean, right now the CPT code wouldn't fit with that because the CPT code only goes to 14 days. Uh, oh, um, fair enough. But what about for RPM billing? Well, I think I think RPM requires a minimum of 16, day, uh, 16 mm -hmm. days of monitoring. I may be mistaken. I don't use RPMs but much. Mm. Well, you know, you've really kind of opened my eyes. I didn't realize that anybody was reimbursing for this, A, and B, that the reimbursement was, re you know, fairly reasonable. Does that include technical and professional components? Yes, that's billed globally. Mm. I don't think they actually have a CPT code for breaking down. The, I, I don't see. think they have a 0.26 modifier on those. Mm. So how can we, as, you know, our sleep medicine colleagues, how can we support these ASM advocacy efforts to get better reimbursement for actigraphy? I think, uh, you know, go to the website, download the template letter, send it on to payers and, uh, that they're aware of. I think uh, if they're politically involved, you know, um, you know, the problem with the reason we have to go through the local coverage determination or the LCDs is because actually changing CMS is an act, truly an act of Congress. So, right. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, down the line, I think that is the ultimate is to get CMS to change their um, their readings. Is you know, mm -hmm. it's literally one. There's in CMS uh, guidelines or CMS uh, rules. It is one of two things that is specifically said it won't be reimbursed. That and uh, polysomnograms for insomnia. Mm. Uh, so you know, uh, if the if you're politically uh, involved, contact their congressmen or senators and and try to uh, advocate for getting the whole policies changed. Yeah, Eric Albrecht taught me a lot about advocacy. So he's always willing to teach people how to better advocate for you know for sleep medicine in general, but also specific. Um, things like this. So he would be a good resource too. 
through the AASM. He's always been really helpful to me. So any final thoughts? No, I just uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to share this information. Well, thank you for joining us today and sharing your clinical usage of actigraphy and all of your experience. Um, I'm hopeful that the AASM advocacy efforts are successful so that more of our colleagues will be able to incorporate actigraphy into their sleep programs. Thanks for listening to Talking Sleep, brought to you by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. For more podcast episodes, please visit our website at aasm.org. You can also subscribe through your favorite podcast service. And if you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to leave a rating or review. For more feedback or suggestions, email us at podcast at aasm.org. I hope you'll join us again for more Talking Sleep. Until next time, this is Seema Kosla, encouraging you to sleep well so you can live well. <laughs>